Good afternoon. You're listening to Gambling with an Edge. Now here are your hosts, Bob Dancer and Richard Munchkin. Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Our guest today is named Porter. He bets player props in sports, among other things. Porter, welcome to Gambling with an Edge. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. All right. So how did you get started betting sports? So before sports, I had a little history and um, other types of gambling. So for almost a decade, I was, uh, and while I was going to school, I was a professional poker player. Um, eventually got to like mid stakes um, after online poker got uh, banned, played mostly stud eight, Omaha eight. Then I moved abroad and was an economist for a little period of time, kind of didn't really like that lifestyle, came back to America. And I started doing some advantage slots. And from there, I did a little bit of um, basically in the state of California, you can be the bank at some of the Los Angeles casinos. If you play two hands as a player, two hands as the bank. So I did that for a period of time. And then at that same exact time, I sort of got into daily fantasy sports. And again, all of these other little things were for short periods of time. And then I just sort of found a sports betting market. I started off in the larger markets, didn't really like the swings, wanted it to somehow be like a job. So I focused on smaller markets and that kind of cut out a lot of the variance. There's still variance, of course. And from there, the rest is history. I've been doing it for about seven years now. I'd say the first year was not like full time, but so like six plus years full time now. I I just want to um, go back to uh, banking in California because uh, I have some experience with that as well. Did you get now it, this to most people who are not familiar? This sounds crazy, but did you get uh, heat for banking and backed off in any of the card rooms? So I did it with me and a couple of my friends where I sort of taught them or we discussed a lot of, it's very important. It's kind of closer to a customer service business where if you see any backlash whatsoever from the table, from you banking, you need to walk away. In general, the LA casinos, I I don't want to say which ones were better, which ones were, some were very bad, some were very good. They really didn't give you that much heat if the customer wasn't upset. So as long as you took accountability and saw and, you know, made an analysis of when you felt the table was not appropriate to bank at, or if you saw any pushback and you got up, we were kind of allowed a pretty long leash. Now, now of course, eventually all long leashes come to an end and you we did get backed off. But really, I, I actually think they were relatively reasonable and it was more about just good interaction with the other people at the table and not upsetting them. It gave you a pretty long sustained run. So we experienced the opposite in that the players liked us a lot because we also tried to be entertaining to the players, but the banking corporations hated us because basically we were taking money out of their pocket. And um, What year? Oh, this would have been uh, 2000s. You know, so like, you know, 15 years ago that something like that. Um, Mm, And there was a large, there was a large um, banking group that sort of, we were convinced had to be laundering money uh, that they were sort of uh, an Asian mob group. And, and, you know, we had players threatened in the parking lot, like, you know, don't come back or, you know, you're going (laughs) to, you know, you could be dead kind of stuff. I think maybe it got cleaned up in the last seven, eight years, or I, I haven't done it in about eight years, so I wouldn't know today. But I, I didn't have too much, too much. I mean, yeah, every once in a while, the floor actually would come and say something. But I would say, as much as I want to criticize casinos and how they operate, I, I didn't have a bad experience really going through yeah, that. Well, that's good. That's good. We also ran into a lot of cheating. So um, that was always a problem. Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, when you bank, you're kind of responsible for the dealer knowing what he's doing. And even if they're not cheating, sometimes the mistakes they make, you know, that could be the swing of your entire hourly net. Right. So you're talking about cheating by your employees, Richard? 
Uh, no, at, well, that was an issue as well. But um, no, the the main thing we ran into in the beginning was the dealer would have an agent at the table and the dealer would cheat to send off money to the agent, which is coming out of the banker's pocket. So, and they had myriad ways of, of uh, you know, scamming you as a banker. So doesn't sound like a profitable business. All right. So let's get back to sports betting. Um, on one of the podcasts I've heard you on, you said you started off with um, closing line value and understanding that. How important is that as a um, starting place, do you think, for new sports bettors to understand? So especially in considering large markets, we'll start there. The story changes significantly in smaller markets, but in large markets, um, the concept is that they're relatively efficient. Now we're not talking, you know, as complicated and as many hedge funds and, you know, big industry companies in, you know, stock market and bond markets, but as you look up the scale of the market size in sports betting, you'll notice that the closing line in general is extremely important. And over a period of time, uh, before understanding modeling, before even understanding sports, understanding how the line movement and where the line closes and consistently getting the better number over time, you're going to realize a profit in the large markets. Now, what starts happening is people, and as blackjack players, I'm sure you yourselves understand, I always like um, large markets a little bit closer to classic blackjack, where your margins are relatively small. It's very hard, very hard for the casual and beginner to understand what a 1% or 2% edge really means. It means you can go through extreme prolonged periods of losing. And when your edge is so small, it's hard to even know if you have any edge at all. By the time something changes in the market, you know, and you're realizing such a small edge, you, you might have had no edge to begin with. Your edge might have changed along the way if you haven't made adjustments. So closing line value over time, though, gives you a true indicator between, you know, tens of hundreds of thousands of people betting and seeing where the line ends. The problem that starts occurring with that is when t people try to extrapolate that into medium and small markets. Because and they do not close right. efficiently. So as time progresses, the idea is that I think these small markets will continue to get more efficient, but the reliance on trying to find a sharp site or a sharp market for sites taking very little money on plays is not realistic. So because they're not taking volume on these plays, you're not getting the wisdom of the crowd. You're really getting the wisdom of a few flagged accounts when it comes to when it comes to legal sites, where, you know, easily I could miss bet a play or just be wrong, you know, everyone's wrong every once in a while, and I'll still get CLV. So to me, once you're an originator, and you're and you're capping these smaller markets, and at the end of the day, you're sitting there looking at the CLV, it, it's a fool's, it's a, it's a, it's a chase, it, it means very little when you yourself are moving markets. And that's not that complicated in tiny markets. So what what do you do? Are you just uh, left with looking at your result? Yeah. So unfortunately, it's kind of, do you have enough volume to be confident that you're a winner or a loser? I, I feel like a lot of beginners, though, there's this, um, let's move on to the next part of kind of after CLV. There's this f fixation really on CLV, really on learning how to handicap. Uh, using tools that give, might give you an edge. And at the end of the day, all of these intricacies that you're learning along the way on, you know, how to handicap, first of all, they probably take hundreds, if not a thousand plus hours to actually get good. A lot of people forget that there's this whole other component to sports betting. So let's say you have like understood how the markets work. If you're a top down 
better. Let's say you've become efficient at handicapping or, you know, reading the market where the lines will move. There's this entire other issue that just kind of gets put aside where people are sold product, sold things, and eventually they're not able to bet anywhere. So there's this extreme fixation on the first part of sports betting without the realization where if you become efficient at what it takes to win, there's this whole other world of how it's hard to actually be able to even bet. And I think that get, gets lost on a lot of people. And it's, I guess it's sad because people are putting in a lot of work to become good and don't realize that they should be putting equal, if not more work into being able to actually bet after they do become good. It just seems like that part is instead spent on complaining and telling people you're good or, you know, turning into selling picks that become difficult to follow if they have any value. And it's this whole fixation in the industry that ignores the business component. And I think a lot of that has to do with the type of individuals who are one, either good at the handicapping or two, what I call the gift of gab, good at the networking. There isn't a good melt of an individual or many individuals who are good at the business side of the industry. And a lot of that has to do with, I, I believe it's this fixation that sports spending is very unique or very different to other industries. But in reality, I don't see it being very any different than other entrepreneurial industries where you have a million different tasks you have to achieve. And it's not just buy a product, sell a product or, you know, come up with a model, bet the model. I, I think it's just it has a lot more components and there's not really anyone out there, nor should they be, I guess, really covering too much about the business side of what it takes to to make it work after you are a winner. This is a concept we talk about a lot on this show. Um, you know, the first step is finding a way to actually have an edge. But then, as you say, it's an entirely different skill set to take the money out of the casino. And you need both. And, um, y you know, in sports betting, it seems that often the originators do better teaming up with somebody who understands the second part, right? You do the originating I bet the money for you, we become a team. And and uh, often that can be a very effective uh, way to go forward. Yeah. I, look, people don't love uh, stereotyping people too much. But in reality, if you think about the individual who's most likely good at sports betting, which basically implies they have a comp sci, math, econ, finance, but probably closer to math and comp sci knowledge, you know, the stereotype of that individual is most likely not the greatest communicator, networker. Um, yeah, look, that's that's a stereotype. It's not one size fits all. But in general, the and then the individuals who are good at networking probably and the gift of gab probably are not the strongest in the math science comp, uh, comp field. Right. Which and is also, uh, you know, often um, those comp sci people, they don't want to do that job. Right. right. I, at least the friends that I have that are, you know, the the numbers guys, they want to sit in front of their computer and, and let somebody else deal with the other parts of it um, right. for the most part, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, if you look at a guy like Billy Walters, obviously he's not a numbers guy, but man, does he know how to get the money down? Um, yeah. So how big is your team? at doing whatever it, it your combination of whatever it is that you do are you doing this by yourself or do you have partners or friends right so there's kind of two different components there's the workspace where we do the actual work and that's a team of four guys um I, actually ideally i'm to be fair all those guys are really overworked they i need more temporary guys to come in and out and help them along but and then there's this other component of how you actually get the money down, which is sort of the side I deal more with, where I find lots of people who, in general, are probably not winners. And I find them and I work with them across uh, the betting landscape, but mostly the PPH space. But, um, you know, getting down at casinos, there's there's plenty of ways to work to work with people. 
But in general, on that end, you're talking about it takes a lot of people to provide enough liquidity. So you're talking about like 40, 40 ish partners on that side that aren't involved in the day to day inputting, day to day modeling, you know, waiting on news, actually doing the inputting work. They're kind of, I think of them as a different type of partner, but just as important as the partners that help me, you know, with the betting side. So um, just for our listeners who are not familiar, PPH stands for pay per head. And those are basically the equivalent of your local bookie at the barbershop who now has a website somewhere and you, you're betting with him. Yeah. And, and legals also, you know, the Fandals, the Caesars of the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now, so do your, uh, uh, we used to call them clients, the, the people who basically hold the accounts. Uh, do they actually do anything or, or is it basically you're just using their identity? No, I mean, their, their, their job is mostly their interaction with the, with the money side of the business. And my job is to provide them the wins. So that's kind of our relationship. So they actually go in and place the bets themselves. Some do, or some interact with where the, you know, where, where the betting occurs. So they, you know, they collect and, you know. The idea is that it's not just a it's smooth ride. See, I don't like to call it clients. I like to call it partnerships because in reality, they they do have some responsibility. You know, they do have some work at the end of the day, and that's any healthy uh, relationship. It doesn't have to be in sports betting. You kind of want both sides to to just you know do a little, make sure they feel involved, be a part of it. So you have enough of these. You must get stiff some of the time. So I would. <laughs> Yeah. So that's a little, that's a little bit more nuanced. You know, if you're in a good partnership with a lot of accounts, um, just like it's my job and it's very difficult to win, some partners will cover parts of the stiff or some partners are big enough where we, you know, you put it into makeup and eventually it's one back anyways. And there's a range, you know, if you're getting stiffed, now, everyone's range is a little bit different. I, I know there's probably some optimal number, but I like to think of it sort of like taxes. If you're getting stiffed less than 5% of the time, you're not taking enough chances on accounts. And if you're getting stiff like 15% of the time or more, that's just my personal range. I, I know there must be an optimal way to calculate that. It's probably even higher, actually, is the optimal range. But if I think if you're getting stiff more than 15% of the time, overall in a year, you're taking on way too much risk and way too much it might be like financially optimal, but just in terms of emotionally, you know, you might have a bad week. And then on top of that, you're, you're taking a few stiffs. Just emotionally, it's not healthy for you or your team. And that's another interesting thing, how you treat your team. Are they just hourly guys? Do they have equity? Are some of the expenses on them? And it's a wide range of the type of employee you'll get who's just there inputting. Look, I'm a huge fan of skin in the game. I really dislike a lot of talking heads that, you know, they say one thing and then they don't put the money on the line. And, and the reason behind that is I don't believe it's possible for most individuals to operate optimally or with enough intent and focus if there isn't enough risk to actually matter. It's just Im- nearly impossible to operate at a high level when that's not there. Now, of course, there are some individuals who can do it, but I would say for the general the general rule is that that's not true and skin in the game is incredibly important um there's risk uh of course of being stiffed by these paper head uh bookmakers but um there's also the risk of having one of your partners stiff you right if they control the money on an account and the account wins a lot it's certainly possible for one of them to just walk with the money Absolutely. So that, you know, that boils down to kind of the person in charge of the networking, his skill. And some people are really good and some people are really bad at it of judging other individuals and their character. And honestly, I have a lot, you know, a lot of times where I have accounts that will eventually get stiff where I know it's coming just based off a few lines that the partner tells me, he'll just write something. And I'm like, this is so obvious what's coming. But it's still worth it for the time being to continue the relationship. I really, and maybe this is just an individual skill set, it really seems to me obvious, not all, but many of the times where a relationship is going to go sour down the line. I think the general strategy, though, from my end is just kind of to kill people with honesty, like pay on time, you know, 
you know, when things aren't going well, like you just, just, just be good with the money and be honest to people. And I think I'm, and it's not just cause I'm some like amazing person. I, I just think those are sound business tactics that work in the long run, brutal honesty, fairness, and communication. It, again, there's this weird fixation in the gambling community that sports betting is something unique. But but again, it's just another business. And if you run common sense business practices, they go a long way. Hmm. You mentioned you would see signs ahead of time. Can you give us a for instance of what kind of a sign that a, uh, one of your people would give you that you know that this is going to go south soon? I mean, you'll just get a line where someone tells you, why they need to delay this week or how they're having issues with PayPal or Venmo or just all the time they will be a day late or two days late, but for no real good reason. It's just happening. And when you can't point, a, you know, really can't, it's a story. When you can't piece the story together, it usually means there's a hinge. Something is broken in the story. So it's the moment I would say many people have it and it's, they have a hard time, like they'll feel that something is wrong or think that something is wrong and just kind of suppress it. And over time, I just felt like this ability of less and less suppressing that feeling and being like, hey, wake up, something's about to happen. And it's usually these one-liners that just, you know, you're talking with somebody, they give you the story, and then you say, hmm, that doesn't make sense. And then you just let it go. That's the norm of what people do instead of kind of, you know, what do I do next? Is this relationship worth the headache? And I think a lot of people just sort of let it go because of greed. And then, so there's two different business strategies in this uh, industry. A lot of people love these <clears throat> huge accounts where you can get down huge sums of money. And in my opinion, that's a terrible business uh, angle for this. You want your, you know, all you know, just like in any other business, all your eggs, not in one basket. So there isn't any one situation that really wrecks you on a week. And if you're spread out that way, and you have proper liquidity, and you've built a bankroll, these stiffs, they're just, they're just not going to ruin you. So they're worth taking the shots on partnerships to do them. One of the like red flag. One of the red flags for me was twi twice, twice, uh, people who ended up stealing from us, uh, told me at the beginning that uh, uh, it was good that, you know, we had hired them because they would never steal, <laughs> which, you know, I, in retrospect, like normal people just don't tell you that <laughs> they don't they don't offer that up out of the blue. Um, yeah. So. Opening with the negative is not a great. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Huh. Well, then I I'll never tell Richard that I'll never steal from him because he'll get suspicious if I do that. Yeah, you're right. So uh, I'm assuming you have lots of accounts and you're a winning player. So presumably some of your accounts say, the bookies say, we don't want your action anymore. So you're always in the mode of finding new places to bet. Is that true? Yeah. So in reality um – I know sometimes I have my tips with touts, but I can understand how a person who's a winner and is tired of the grind moves on and decides to sell picks because this endless process of what I call searching for liquidity, searching for where to bet, it, it's tiresome. So I, I can see at the end of the day why people transition to something else. Now that has its all other, other set of issues and difficulties and why it's probably not good. But in general, it is a grind to endlessly be searching for these accounts while at the same time also trying to provide winners. Yeah. And how do you, if you actually do have the skill to provide winners, how do you prevent them from just being crushed immediately once you give out your, your pick? You don't. So when you, when, when a tout is good, uh, what will happen in this industry? The industry is just not that big. So the big players who have lots of accounts, they'll find you. And if you're posting these picks, they will extract the value, especially in small markets and, and medium markets too. Now, there probably aren't any real winners in Sunday morning NFL sides and totals. But in these small markets, there are individuals 
who, when they post, you know, on Twitter, they are winners. But you're talking about one account that got two hundred dollars down in New Jersey. You know that that's what that's what you're that's what these records are really showing. So and yeah. that really discourages individuals too who might see like a 57, 58, 60 percent win rate, and it's just like, listen, if you had thirty accounts and you picked off the stale, slow, or just broken line, your, your record's going to look good, and that's really discouraging to the casual that expect some, you know. You win 80% of the plays or again, it's very hard to conceptualize and understand what even a 7% edge means, let alone a 2% edge. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're betting, say, uh, NFL, you can't get enough bets in a season to have a statistical relevant result, right? Yeah, I mean, you're talking about not many games, though, yeah. though I would say most people nowadays, if you're listening to this show or follow gambling Twitter, they're not really believing people beating Sunday morning lines. NCAF, NCAAB, these medium-sized markets, extra games, those things make more sense. But I would say your listener probably on this show is a little bit more advanced than thinking. I mean, it would be the equivalent of someone effectively saying they're crushing the stock market over an extremely long period of time. Although we did have Ed Thorpe on the show. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, well, you know, teach yeah. his own. <laughs> And we have lots more to talk about with Porter, but first we have some commercials. If you're serious about card counting, the Blackjack Apprenticeship membership is a great way to learn, train, network, and get the resources you need to succeed. We've had quite a few guests on Gambling with an Edge who exclusively trained and got their start through Blackjack Apprenticeship. Check out the website at blackjackapprenticeship.com. They have member forums, training software, and guides to help you learn. That's blackjackapprenticeship.com, and you will find a link in the show notes. Videopoker.com is the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 a month or $79.95 a year, this allows you to get correction on most of the games. The game of the week is Hot Roll Poker. This is a 10 coins per line game where one time in six you get a multiplier. The value of the multiplier is determined by a pair of fair virtual dice. If the dice roll a 2 and a 5, for example, you receive 7x for the hand. The multiplier sometimes comes on the draw, sometimes on the deal, never both. There are no strategy variations required for this game compared to the base game. And the hot roll feature is even money, meaning that the dice add no EV, but they do add variance which means excitement, and sometimes it means extra W2Gs. If you're interested in getting an edge at sports betting, then unabated.com is a great resource for you. Founded by frequent Gambling with an Edge guests, Captain Jack and Rufus Peabody, unabated.com is designed for both new and experienced sports bettors. Their real-time odds screen, tools, and calculators take a lot of the guesswork out of trying to quantify your edge. There's also plenty of free education and instruction to help you along your journey to becoming a sharper sports better. You can currently take advantage of a seven-day free trial to decide if premium membership at Unabated is right for you. All right, we are back talking with Porter. Tell us about losing streaks and winning streaks in sports betting. Right, so in general, I think the simplest way to think about it is the larger the market, the larger your variance will be, so the more prolonged downswings. The smaller the market, the less variance and the shorter your down streaks can be. Now, in large medium markets, I've heard of individuals who I know are good and who I know are winners have losing seasons. That would be relatively abnormal in a sm very small market. But honestly, you know, if you flip the coin 10,000 times, you're going to go through streaks where a thousand times you're going to get tails 300 and heads 700. And if you're in this business long enough, those events, they're definitively going to happen to you eventually. And a lot of it is, you know, your mental fortitude and not making, mis you know, not making mistakes because of the tilt that you go on. I, I think actually one of the best strategies for that, for people who do go on tilt is to actually find markets that are so small you can't bet enough to actually hurt yourself. And if you focus on those markets, you're one edge is greater. And two, it's basically impossible for if you do have, you know, tilt, tilt is usually some kind of like 
this thought process of you're owed or deserve something. So I think if you can kind of get around this, I'm unique, I'm different, I'm owed, I deserve better than this mindset, you can really avoid a lot of this like mental weakness, I guess you could say, during uh, tilting times. But in general, every single person, no matter what they're doing, no matter how big their edge is, will eventually go through swings. And some people have the makeup for it, and some people honestly don't. And it's a lot easier to go through those swings if you're appropriately betting, or I would even say under betting your bankroll. It's it's difficult to really send yourself into a spiral if, again, you're just using common sense business strategies, you know, would you rather invest in a company that's making the same amount of dollars, but has 10 million in loans or 1 million in loans? You know, it's just all about, are you properly leveraged? Are you properly positioned? And a lot of times, of course, you're going to go on tilt. If you lost 40% of your bankroll, there's, there's, there's no one who's, you know, mentally strong enough when you lose half of everything in in 30 minutes. So it's just a question. And, And, you know, that, puts you in another situation. I mean, some people are putting in a lot of work, get good, bet small. And when you calculate your EV, you might as well have been working at McDonald's, making the same amount of money. So it's hard to really conceptualize swings, conceptualize how much it takes to get down to make meaningful. And that's different for each person, what meaningful is and what it takes to sustain their lifestyle. But swings happen. And there, anytime you hear anybody telling you they're up, 175 units in a short period of time, you know, they're either one lying or two, they also have sprees of negative 300 units. You know, there isn't this magic formula of just absolutely crushing and destroying. If there was, no one would be posting about it because they would be a billionaire. You know, if you actually could have a five, 10% edge on Sunday morning NFL, rest assured, there are plenty of places to get down enough on that where you would need to talk to another soul, you'd be so rich. So again, a lot of this has to do with stories. When you listen to a story, if the story doesn't add up, it's probably best to move on and make some other decision. It's really not that, shouldn't be that difficult when people are making outlandish claims to sort of, you know, turn your shoulder to it and figure something else out. When you talk about unit size, I mean, I would assume you're not betting the same unit on every bet, right? The larger your edge, the more units you're going to bet. So it's it's kind of hard to compare just based on number of units. Yes, that works on a medium large size market. Um, like me personally, my unit is just whatever the maximum I can get down across all the sites because it's never enough to actually properly fill like a Kelly because I'm not betting NFL Sunday morning. I'm betting these small markets where a lot of places, you know, even if you have 100 accounts, you can only get $200 down on each one of these. So you're not really able to bet these astronomical numbers, no matter how big you are, especially because of the fact that if you do do well, are, are you really able, and maybe some people do have the gift of gab ability to replenish at an even higher rate than they're losing. But when you go through prolonged downswings, I had a guy once tell me this and I scoffed at it, but I see a little bit of a little bit of truth behind this where you're kind of building equity in the account where in reality you should get some be allowed some playback. Now, in the PPH world, you know, person could get upset after two weeks of winning and cut you off after you're down. But in general, not every loss is exactly a loss and not every win is exactly a win. There is some different values to what happens in a situation. So Sometimes you win on an account that's crushed the week before, and that win is going to cause you to get stiffed. Losing on that Monday, while nobody wants to lose, it's not the same as losing on an account that lost the week before. So even within the unit sizing and the betting, wins and losses don't always mean the same thing. Do you do do something to try to... um season an account when you get it to at the beginning or or do you just all right i have a new account i'm gonna bet it the way i always bet it absolutely no seasoning i don't recommend anyone do that maybe on legal sites like DraftKings, caesars there might be some logic to that but absolutely under no circumstances it's already hard enough for people to win to actually season it it's better to spend your energy and time on finding more outs than trying to do now now if you have one or two or three accounts and can't get more 
That's a different answer. Absolutely. If you're trying to preserve the account, you should take a different approach. But on a large scale, it makes zero sense. It actually makes like negative sense. But Yeah, I, I, this is what I tell blackjack card counters too, that you, you do not have an edge big enough to uh, warrant playing any cover at all. You can't afford to play cover uh, when your edge is so small. Yeah, that's soft skills and hard skills. It's two different components of the business. Yeah, there's no cookie cutter answers to any one thing. In general, these are rules to follow for sports betting of, you know, focus on winning, not on extending the life of an account. But there are probably situations where that would be a viable strategy. It's very difficult to incorporate them when you're running something at scale, though. Yeah. So now you are not a fan of um, uh, efficient markets <laughs> or, or books that, um, that take that approach. You want to yeah. talk about that? Yeah, so I would say there's, you know, a couple companies out there that a lot of sharps like. And to me, it reminds me of poker. It's a story of the beginning of the end. When you see markets taking astronomical size bets, it's because they are efficient. Now, I get that a lot of people have egos out there and think they have a 3 4% edge when they're getting down 100,000. And it probably does happen sometimes, but it also happens where those guys are getting down and it's a negative 1% edge, where this love of like large betting, places that allow you to bet large, is misguided. In reality, especially for most people, it's already hard enough to win. This idea of large bets means that the market is becoming more efficient. So a lot of people's greatest strength is actually the fact that these sites limit. Now, I know that sounds crazy to people because even I myself am all the time saying how unfair it's that we're limited. I mean, they're running a business. It's fair that it's limited. But the idea behind limiting, it's actually good for sharps. And it's especially good for like mediocre uh, winning, small winning players. And that's because it directly implies that the market will become Now, still, the market over time will become more efficient. That's just nature. It's going to become more efficient year over year. But in general, when the limits are smaller and the bands and the limits occur faster, it implies that the market will have inefficiencies. They just go hand in hand. So now you're shifting your focus on networking and gathering accounts and still getting to bet into inefficient or relatively inefficient markets. I know that concept's really hard to, to swallow because people hate the grind of the account getting. And that's why I kind of try to stress this overfocus on handicapping, uh, top down winning or using tools to win or whatever it is that it takes to win is greatly overemphasized because in reality, if you become proficient in those, you will be limited and yet limiting keeps the market inefficient. So there's this balance of the casual just basically needs to accept that somehow or or way he should either form a partnership or he himself be more well-rounded because in the end, you need a lot of different components to succeed in this industry monetarily. Yes, in theory, you can write your plays down, you're a winner, but at the end of the day, it's about extracting the dollars. It's not about having good plus EV. It is about having good plus EV plays. And I know that if you have the right process, you'll end up with the right results. But part of that process has to do with figuring out how to continue to be able to get down and not just this over focus on how to win at sports betting, which is really all you see out there being sold to people. This argument goes on in the blackjack world too, where people believe that conditions in the states where they are allowed to, they are allowed to bar you are better than places like New Jersey where they're not. Um, so, yeah. Now, uh, recently we had Plus EV Analytics on, and he uh, similarly he kind of uh, blamed this on the on all of the odd screen tools that if you if if uh, more and more people start using odd screens then the whole market becomes more efficient and makes it harder for everyone uh, you know, to actually find winning plays. Yeah, plus EV and I don't always see eye to eye. <laughs> but uh, in this sense, 
there is no question, not just odd screens, odd screens also, but a lot of these tools that are being sold, I don't want to mention them specifically, but a lot of these tools being sold to people that are good are making the market more efficient. Um, it's just straight up a zero sum game. Someone wins, someone loses in the sharp and non sharp market. I'm not talking about what the casino takes out themselves, but at the end of the day, it's no different than when um, this one company came, started coming out with videos for poker. It started teaching people how to become more efficient. There were always articles, but then there was coaching and then there was in depth and that made every single individual better. So today, I mean, I remember sitting at like a World Series of Poker event and uh, this lady flashed her card and I Googled her and she had no tournament results. And she made a really weird fold, looks at me and tells me I needed to protect my three bet fold equity uh, in the future. And I'm like, this lady has no catches in a live poker tournament and is talking about advanced strategy. So you can see these trends over time where the market is becoming more efficient. Now, people will immediately say something new is always coming back. But you know what? The sportsbook themselves, while they're pushing the envelope and creating new product, they're also becoming more efficient over time. And like every other market, over a period of time, I believe that people stay in those markets because of safety and familiarity for too long. And when a market gets more difficult, if you're an individual who was crushing at poker and then doing less well and then crushing at sports betting and doing less well a lot of people now this could be because maybe a lot of them also have life leaks where they didn't save enough but if you didn't have those leaks i believe a lot of people are too conservative and too worried about moving on and when it's obvious that things are getting more difficult people are afraid to take the next step which sometimes means moving on to something else and I know for me personally, that sort of happened with poker where I did really well, then started doing less well and tried to hang on. And I would say as shocking as maybe it would sound, because right now things are good. I have no qualms that if I see a turn in the market, that I'm ready to move on to something else. And that's part of having an edge in reality. There are other edges other than just the winning, the W's and the L's in the bets. And it's just kind of like this all encompassing, I guess you could call it like a life, uh, life skill of understanding these things where it's just don't just focus on this like one component of winning and losing. There are so many other elements that are necessary to actually make you a winner when it comes down to that final result, which usually means, you know, extracting money, holding on to the money, because what good is it to win? And then after a year, you just tilt and you lose everything. There's there's really not, why did you spend so much time learning to become a great handicapper or learning to read the odd screen? There's these other skills that just completely seem to get neglected. When you talk about um, going out to find uh, potential partners, uh, are are you involved in some kind of social thing that brings you in contact with lots and lots of people all the time? Or, I mean, you can't just go out to a bar and, and, you know, meet people and say, Hey, can I bet on your account? Uh, I mean, if you go to a bar and you see someone watching their phone more than talking to their friends about like whatever that is that they're hanging out, this is indicative of something. A lot of people, I guess, wouldn't do that. But I don't mind striking in conversation. Now, by no means is the second line, let me bet on your account. That's what, No, of course. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you can, you can you, what if you have 30, 40 situations like that where you're building them over time, you know, talking to them and eventually, you know, that becomes a process. Look, the invent, especially post COVID or during COVID, Twitter has become a very powerful tool podcasts and YouTube have become a very powerful tool. So there are a lot of tools available to people. Um, look, I, in my opinion, it would be very difficult today to start from scratch and be a network gatherer because there are winners out there. So really, what is it that you're setting yourself apart, differentiating yourself uh, from other people at this point to make you that that's why I actually never targeted large markets, I could never see a clear pathway in my mind as to why someone would give me an account over someone who's established. So I wanted to hit the markets. Look, so I got every, everything in life kind of, it's if you're early, you know, if there's 50% of the information available and you're operating at 80%, that's 
much better than if there's 95% of information available and you're operating at 99.999% of the edge. So a lot of this has to do with early. And I would say that today, while a lot, and you'll see this on Twitter, while a lot of people think they're early now into sports betting, they're not. This isn't the, the legalization of sports betting was not the beginning of sports betting. You know, this has been going on for a while. Usually, I believe legalization and market tightening, all these things actually lead to the end of a market. You, you're starting to see the end. I'm talking about from the sharp side. This is just the beginning for gambling addiction in America. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I Go ahead, Bob. You now, you now specialize in betting props. Uh, why did you choose this particular specialty and... What kind right. of props? So, kind of like what I was talking about before, where size and totals, the edges were smaller. I consistently heard people that I respected say, you cannot get serious money down on props. And that immediately told me it was so obvious. It's kind of like someone says, this is no good that's in this space. It almost either means they're doing it, which I later found out they weren't, or they haven't figured out how to do it. So, there must be a hole and a gap to fill in this market. So the real reason why I got into it was I consistently would hear, you cannot get down in this market. So I was like, that means they're not doing it. That means there must be a niche to fill in this market. And then the type of bets that means is basically you're looking at individual players. So it can be from a bench guy to a starter. So will LeBron score more or less than 27 and a half points today? Will Mahomes pass for more or less than 296 and a half yards on this uh, Sunday morning. So it's almost always what the individual player is doing. And it's just a much easier market. The truth is, it's just an easier market to beat. Now, there are a lot of people entering the space now, especially from the DFS industry, where that market has become efficient because so many people are actually giving good advice. So you see a lot of those people now shifting to sports betting. And they're not dummies. Like they, there is... There are good tools and good information out there where people will begin to make this market more efficient over time. That's just how it works in any market. If it seems good, people will enter the space. And you know what? There's a cultural shift in America, too. I know now this is just anecdotal, but I believe it's happening on a larger scale where a kid is finishing his master's in comp sci and he's not embarrassed to take a year off and give a shot at sports betting. I know that sounds crazy, but you're talking about it only takes 10 or 20 guys like this. And I'm sure it's more to begin to make a market more efficient. So you're starting to see a leak where it's culturally acceptable to sports bet or culturally acceptable to work at a sports betting company that didn't exist beforehand. You know, now I guess one of the, the, my guess is the sports betting companies are not willing to invest enough money in individuals who are like good at the handicapping process. So those guys are betting. But I bet if the market gets big enough that you will begin to see a shift in the other direction and they will acquire talent. You know, other corporations have gone through these swings too, you know, where they just hire better talent over time. It's still a young industry here. But don't get me wrong. I mean, I know I sound pessimistic. There's still plenty of edge there today, but. To me, it's very obvious that the market is getting tougher and people will then immediately counter and say, well, something new will come up. And I would just like to say that I think the sports books are getting better over time. And it's like that in every in every market yeah. that becomes efficient and it's been around for a while. It's not unique. Nothing lasts forever. Right. Just, and But for the skilled APs, as you said, they constantly adapt and shift and move on to something else. Right. So then it's just a factor is, is my time better spent somewhere else or best spent here? And then you're just allocating your time for resource for, you know, your result, really. At the end of our show, we have a recommended section. Uh, Richard, do you have anything to recommend to our listeners today? Yeah, I recently um, used Hotel Slash. Um, there's a, a for years and years, Bob and I have uh, been fans of Auto Slash, as many of our listeners are, where once you make a reservation, Auto Slash will automatically uh, contact you if they find a better rate. So they now have a Hotel Slash site that does the same thing for hotel rooms. They are still in beta, 
and you have to ask for um, an early activation code. But um, uh, I've just used it one time. Uh, I like it. I will use it in the future. So you might want to check it out. That's hotelslash.com. So I was just in Vegas this last week, and after a little battle at the uh, customer service area, they reinstated my seven stars. And to celebrate that uh, joyous moment event, uh, I ended up going to Guy Savoy at Caesars. And uh, if Caesars is out there giving you a comp, I highly recommend eating there. Very good. Um, I've actually eaten a lot of Caesars restaurants. I've not eaten at Guy Savoy. Or Guy Savoie. I heard it pronounced so many different ways. But um, yeah, I'm not sure. It's uh, very good. All right. Thank you, Porter, for joining us today. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, thank you guys very much for having me on. Go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day.